Wait, you didn't do row. over and under. Two, well, not yet, because okay, okay. I have to... Do, 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 I'm do. curious. We'll, we'll, get we'll get there. We'll get there. All right, go, go. All right, Glass and Bricks. The Glass Road is a 150-mile-long path through the Bavarian forest near the border to the Czech Republic. It reminds, or it reminds of the great times of glass production. When you travel along the Glass Road today, you can still feel the heat of this handcraft that was omnipresent in many arborous areas of the early modern age. Glass and bricks were used long before the Middle Ages. Over 7,000 years ago, the Egyptians already knew of glass. The Sumerians in the Middle East, on the other hand, are said to have invented and used bricks about 6,000 years ago. Then it goes on to the Romans, etc., etc. Today, there are no forest glass works left in the Bavarian forest, but the glass road still leads to a number of locations of former and current glass production. Today, there aren't any brick fields left in the Black Forest. However, there are some brick works left open, giving evidence of the long history of brick making. So what is it we're looking at here in Glass Road? Well, a number of things, as you can tell. For those that are unfamiliar, you have a number of different boards here. So we have the building board, which shows three different types of buildings on it in the supply stacks for the three different types of buildings on it. Each of us has our own landscape board in which has various uh, areas on the board as well as areas for us to build our buildings. So above the main uh, building board, we have the four types of landscape tiles that are in the game. The big one being the forest tiles. Then we have the ponds or the lakes, the sand pits, and the groves as well. And the aforementioned three different types of buildings. The blue ones here in the top row with the blue parchment kind of area behind it is our processing buildings. The immediate buildings, these are the ones with the kind of fawn colored or beige colored mm -hmm. uh, parchment paper. These are one-time use buildings. The blue ones you can use throughout the game. And finally, the kind of tan-ish orange-ish, brown-ish buildings are bonus buildings or in-game buildings that will score at the end of the game. Now, everybody has their own kind of tableau here, this being mine, Jess's as being over on the left-hand side. So each of us has a production wheel. There are two types of production wheels. There is a glass production wheel, which these resources will help in the production of glass, whereas these resources will help in the production of brick. Now, each of the different resources, we have glass, sand, uh, porridge or oatmeal or food is mm -hmm. what it is, charcoal, water, and wood, and then we have bricks as well as charcoal, clay, and again, porridge. So you'll notice that the porridge or food and the charcoal are on two different uh, wheels here. That's going to be an important distinction. Everybody has as well 15, uh, their own identical set of 15 cards, and then their board predetermined setup, and you can see where the setup is here. It shows actually where each of these things go at the beginning of the game, along with two starting areas from which to be able to build buildings. So that's everything that you're looking at, and of course the first player marker, but you know, hey, we're going to use ours, so we'll go ahead and get rid of that one. There we go. All right. So how do you actually play the game? Well, in Glass Road, we're going to try and hopefully succeed in producing glass and bricks over four building periods. Now, a building period is a round in this game. Aside from glass, you will also need to produce bricks and collect wood and clay to build buildings. Only the value of your buildings will determine your final score and whether you will win the game or not. To, ac to accomplish the task, you will need the help of a variety of specialists, which is your deck of cards. When choosing your specialist, try to anticipate which ones your opponents will choose to be able to use your own more effectively. Yep. All right. So as I said, the game plays out over four rounds. There is a variant in which you can play over five rounds, but we're going to play this over four rounds, okay? Now, in each round, each of us 
has our choice, our entire choice, of the 15 cards in our deck. And as I mentioned, they are identical, and I have some out here as examples to be able to describe them. What we're going to do in a given round is we are going to choose five of our cards for our hand of cards. And then starting with the first player, now, this being a two-player game, it's a little bit different. Uh, in a two-player game, we're going to, whoever's the first player is going to play one of their cards face up mm -hmm. and if their opponent has or Jess in this case if Jess has the exact same card in her hand she must play it to the right side of her tableau and in that case we're both going to get limited use of that card as opposed to the full use of the card mm -hmm. then a uh, turn will alternate she will play the next card same rule applying going back and forth until one of us has run out of cards in the normal three and four player game what it is is everybody will turn one card face down and then they'll activate it in turn order turning them face up in turn order but as it is this being a two player we don't need to worry about that right so before i go any further we probably ought to talk about the different cards in our decks. Now, as I said, there are 15 different cards and they're going to have, some will have prerequisites, some will not. And all will give us some sort of benefit, be it resources or the ability to build buildings. So let's go ahead. And as I said, these are identical between all the players' decks. So the Slash and Burn Farmer. Anytime you see this kind of red parchment area, that shows a prerequisite that must be paid or discarded or spent or fill in the right word in order to be able to take the action. So the Slash and Burn Farmer says you must remove one forest. What does that mean? That means one of the large forests from our tableau we must remove and then it will open up a couple of building spaces, but that would be the prerequisite to then be able to gain resources here. All right, so we would gain either two charcoal or possibly and two food, mm -hmm. okay? Whereas here, this would be paying one charcoal. So now would be a good time to talk about our production wheels. So whenever you gain resources for any of these resources, you're going to actually move them up. These counters go from range from zero all the way up to seven. We're talking about these resources on the right side or the clockwise side of the hands of the clock is right. a good way to put it. Mm -hmm. So then here we have any anytime you gain one of these resources, you're going to move it up that many steps. Anytime you're going to spend a resource, you're going to move it back down towards zero, obviously. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if I have two food here and I spend one food, I would move this down to one. If I were to gain one food, I would move it up to three. Pretty self-explanatory, pretty simple. Right. However, <laughs> now is a point where I want to talk about the glass and the bricks that are on the other side of the wheels. Now, they will always stay in the smaller area of the wheels, and those will range from zero to three. So that is the max that you can have of a, be it glass or brick, whereas any of the other resources is a max of seven, technically 14 for food and charcoal since it's on two different wheels. Mm -hmm. So anytime there is a space available to push the wheel without it pushing a resource, it must do so. Right. So here we go. So let's talk about this Slash and Burn Farmer. If I discarded this one forest off of my board, I would be able to, uh, provided that Jess did not also have this card in her, ta in her hand, to be able to do both of those. So I would get two charcoal and two uh, food. Now, with those being on different, or on uh, multiple wheels, I can choose all or one in which to be able to gain those resources. If I choose charcoal here, I go one, two. Now, I could not go one charcoal, one charcoal, but I could go charcoal on this one, food on this one. When you gain a resource, it's always all on one wheel. Okay, does that make sense? Yes. All right, but you'll notice now there is the availability for this to move without actually pushing a resource. So boom, like that, I now have one brick. Mm -hmm. Okay, now if it just so happened that then on a subsequent action, I gain a couple of clay that will then immediately move, etc. And then as I gain more and more resources, let's say it were something like this to where I would gain potentially two more brick. Well, if you look, 
I push it once there. Well, now if I were to gain any more, I would be pushing a resource. Mm -hmm. You cannot do so. No. Okay, so that is it. We are maxed at three bricks and here as such. Mm -hmm. Now, there is one sneaky little catch about this game that I do want to stress. I'm not going to talk strategy too much, but I do want to point out that I have one clay. Mm -hmm. But if I do gain any charcoal here, let's say I gain a charcoal, I then afterwards move the wheel. I now lose the charcoal that I just gained, and I did have one clay. I no longer have clay, right. but I have a brick. That is important to note when it comes to being able to build these buildings up here. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. So, any questions about the production wheels here? No. All right, moving on. So here you'll notice that you would have to spend one charcoal. You could spend it from either of the two wheels and either gain two food or I should say gain two food and or gain one food per pond tile. How many ponds do I have? I have two, so I would gain a maximum of four food provided that Jess did not also have the card to play down, which I will talk about more in a little bit. The pit worker has no prerequisite, says you may gain a pit and one clay. So gaining a pit, well, that's why we have that stack of pits up the top. I then could go ahead and put this down on any available space, say I do so there, because the reason I might want to do that is I'm going to gain either sand or clay based on however many sand pits that I have. Pretty, pretty obvious stuff, pretty self-explanatory. Moving on to the supplier, says take two of any resource and your opponents get one of those. Okay, easy enough. And can build a building. Well, I'm going to go ahead and grab a couple of, one of each of these buildings over here and I will go ahead and grab, say, these. So now that we've explained our cards, let's go ahead and talk about the building tiles here. All right, three different types of buildings. Processing, immediate, and in-game scoring. Immediate, what does that mean? It means they're one-time use. The prerequisites or the cost in which to build them are over here on the left-hand side. If there is a wood cost, it will be shown here. Well, you'll notice there's nothing here, but you'll notice that these two both have a wood cost. It will always be at the top. Mm -hmm. The second one is glass. You'll notice that none of these show glass, so none of them will cost glass. Clay will always be in the third spot, and brick will always be in the bottom spot. So this building, this clay depot, or depot if you prefer, one clay and one brick. You would then immediately have to spend them, oh wait, I can't build it because I don't have the, I could spend the clay, but I don't have the brick to spend. Hashtag plan better, but let's <laughs> say I could. I then will gain two clay per empty space adjacent to this building. So once I build it, I then place it out here and I would gain, gain two clay for every space adjacent. Adjacency in this game is always orthogonally adjacent, meaning this space, this space, and this space, but those are not empty. Ergo, I would gain two clay. This is not adjacent because, well, it's diagonal. And then last but not least, in-game points are in the little bag in the top right hand corner. So once this is done, you're not going to flip it over, but just know that once this is done, you can no longer use this building because it's an immediate building. You know that because it's that tan or fawn color. In-game scoring, pretty self-explanatory. Spend three wood when I build it. And then at the end of the game, I'm going to score four points. That's what this little star means is it's going to be a variable amount four points for each four groves, if I have four groves in my tableau. Well, I have two, so maybe I'm going to want to gain two other groves to be able to score that for four points at the end of the game. Otherwise, it's not going to be worth jack squat. Right. All right, any questions? Good, moving on. Now, the processing buildings. Processing buildings, this is an anytime action, meaning anytime after you've built this, you can do this, even on someone else's turn. Spend two wood, two bricks. This turns one charcoal into two clay, and it's worth three points at the end of the build or at the end of the uh, game. Easy enough. You can do that at any time. Any questions about the gist of the buildings? As I said, the game will take place in which 
we're going to play a card from our five that are in our hands. So in this case, let's say I play the Slash and Burn Farmer. Now, if Jess does not have that card in her hand, then she says, okay, continue. I may pay the cost and then I may take all of the bonus or all of the advantages, all the benefits of that card. I get to do all of it. If I choose not to pay the cost, I get to do none of it. If it doesn't have a cost, you still, it's always a may. However, when I play this card, if this is in Jess's hand, she's going to play it out there to the right of her tableau. To the right, there you go. Right, this is there are two slots over there that you'll notice little cutouts for because this can happen a maximum of two times per round. When I play this card, I announce it, Jess says, oh, I do have it, and she must play it if she has it in her hand, if she has a slot available in which to do so. In that case, I then may pay the prerequisite, and then I get to do either or in that case. Mm -hmm. And then Jess must pay the, or may pay the prerequisite, and she can do either or. And then it becomes her turn. And the exact same thing happens. If, I, if she plays a card that I have in my hand, I must play it out here. If it just so happens that she has done this twice, in which I've played a card in which she has now done this twice. If I play a subsequent card on another round, and she's already played two out here, she does not play it again, because there's only slots for two of them. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. So we're going to continue to alternating actions until one of us has run out of cards. That will signify the end of the round. We will switch the first player marker to the other person. We will take all of the cards back into our hands, and then we will choose five of the 15, rinse and repeat, and then go into final scoring. Final scoring is these three printed buildings onto our tableau if they have not been covered up by buildings that show a brick outline on their buildings, as such some of these do. Then we will go ahead and tally up all of our scores. You do not round because you'll notice this is a half point per sand. Whoever has the most points wins. That's the gist of it. There may be a couple other little details here and there. We'll go over as we encounter them. Any questions, J-Rex? Um, just to make sure, it was a little bit ambiguous, that Forester's Lodge, it actually does have to be four in a two-by-two two grid, not Fair, four. Uh, anyway. Correct, yes, it has to be. I knew you be, knew that, right, but right. it does have to be yep. as laid Good out. Good point. There we go. That's it. Any questions? That's it. All right, I'm cool. Insane. You want to grab your cards?